Yeah, um, my background is in mostly in small uh, tech startup companies, usually in the size of three to 20 people, um, and usually doing web backgrounds, uh, web-based systems. So my goal for today is to try to give some tools and techniques to help uh, avoid technical debt in those small company environments. Um, obviously, if you're in a larger environment, you're gonna have a different set of problems, but maybe there's some things um, from, my, from my smaller company experience that might apply for you as well. Um, I'll say in the smaller company environments, the tech debt stuff really ends up being a matter of, will this company survive? It's not so much a, hey, this is gonna be an expensive mess to clean up later, it's we might not actually make it to next month or next year if we don't deal with this. So let's try the clicker. What is technical debt? If you look at the uh, internet and go for meme searches, this is what you get. Um, the developer's view, that's water splooshing out um, kind of underneath. Um, that's a pretty informal definition, but it is kind of humorous for those who might not have run across the term before. Um, more formally, technical debt is considered the deferred work created by shipping earlier versus later. Now, this definition originally comes from Ward Cunningham um, in 1992, and more specifically, he's actually saying, when you ship stuff, you know you're gonna uh, hit problems, have things you need to clean up, you need to clean those things up really shortly thereafter. So the technical debt that he's talking about is what happens when you don't clean those things up that you know about after you ship kind of in the near future. You leave them for the much later delayed future. Um, so it's really, it's not about trying to like build the perfect piece of software, having the abstraction layers right. It's much more as a process going back and saying, hey, there's some stuff we need to clean up and improve on that. Um, so the danger really is not, the danger is in not reworking the code right after you ship it. Um, and the challenge is that skipping that work gets in the way of uh, future stuff. Now, as somebody whose uh, background includes using the word geek, um, I of course naturally occasionally go off in tangents. Uh, cutting corners, when I was writing this talk, I was like, hmm, I wonder where that phrase comes from. And this is a total tangent, um, but it was a fun one. Um, so while working on this talk, I looked at the history and discovered that cutting corners actually came from hunting. It's a hunting term from the mid-1800s. If you've got a hare out in the wild that's running and you've got your hound chasing the hare, you as the rider are not supposed to cut the corner because you will disturb the scent that the hound is using to chase the hare. And I just thought that was so cool and totally random. <laughs> so what happens when you have too much technical debt? Well, doing the delayed work later is going to cause more work. Um, which causes longer lead time for future work, which gets you in trouble with management at some point because they don't understand. Um, it leads to more brittle code, more bugs, and potentially even developers that are unhappy because the thing they really want to build is the product, and yet here they are having to go off on a tangent to build something else. So tech debt is neither good nor bad. It's not, it's not a binary. It's not like you have either tech debt or no tech debt. It's how much tech debt you have. Um, and it's, it's rarely zero. So if I were to um, do a hand-weavy diagram, it would look something like this. Basically, on the, on the left side, less debt that takes you longer to get to market, or really, really um, you can ship features um, slower, uh, and your new features, uh, how to say, less tech debt also means slower to ship new features because you're busy refactoring your code, but in the long run, it's probably good for you. Um, but the cost of doing it on the right side of the graph is you can ship things faster in the short run, but eventually that technical debt catches up with you. So different companies have different curves for this. Um, I'll tell you, having worked in a presidential campaign for the first summer, that it's actually a wonderful environment for technical debt because you don't care. Nothing has to run more than 18 months. There is no concept if I have to come back to this. And then on the flip side, you get situations like NASA where hey, your unit conversion was wrong, and so your Mars, your Mars orbital um, uh, climate orbit uh, totally crashes, and you know, bad stuff happens on that side. So it, it really is kind of this interesting challenge of figuring out what's the right amount of debt for your environment. Um, it's also kind of funny that both the examples here are government-related in some context. So Martin Fowler, um, software engineer and author uh, has this model, it basically has two different axes for technical debt. He talks about reckless versus prudent, and then inadvertent versus deliberate. Um, and I thought this is actually a pretty good understanding of how to think about classifying technical debt. And I spent some time thinking about this and, and realized if I colored it in and kind of gave it two different um, attributes of saying, hey, how sophisticated is this team and the particular project we're working on? 
is that something that's kind of knowable in some sense. And in the ideal world, you'd be in the upper right corner. You know, you've got a team that really understands how to make good, prudent decisions about things, um, and they can do it deliberately because they understand kind of the environment that they're working in. So maybe you're building a, a small e-com platform. Um, maybe you're you know, doing something that's kind of been a, uh, done before, a solved problem, as opposed to doing something that nobody's done before. Um, you may find yourself in the lower right area inadvertently, which uh, looking at a lot of kind of agile uh, approaches seem to be very well suited to being kind of in that quadrant, in the sense that you can build something, you ship it, you come back, you iterate on it. You're not gonna necessarily be able to deliberately know everything, but you can at least kind of have an approach and a process that lets you correct for, and course correct for those things. And if you're in the left half of the diagram, well, we'll come back to this later. Um, it depends on your situation. It might be actually totally fine in the case of like a presidential campaign because you don't really care. You can be reckless about your technical debt. Um, but in other cases, you might actually become a real problem. So I'm gonna propose a term technical loan to describe the upper right quadrant. You know, if we've got technical debt as deferred work created by shipping earlier versus later, then I would say a technical loan is that deliberate, prudent use of delaying work. Think of it kind of like a home loan. You know, that kind of debt can be good in the sense that when handled correctly, you can get further than you could get with no debt at all. Uh, just be careful that you don't create your own subprime mortgage crisis. <laughs> So I tried to figure out how to visualize this in some way that was easy graph to understand, and there are certainly charts like this that come out of project management setups. Um, but getting a graph of something like this, you know, basically how much time you spent doing engineering work um, and understanding that part of engineering work is some amount of technical debt stuff. Um, getting a graph of this uh, may not be easy, but there is kind of some hand wavy ways you can do it. I've actually found if you ask your team at the end of each week, hey, how many days of work did you have this week? You know, exclude vacations, exclude your out sick. And then how many of those days were you spent doing something that's new for the business, actually building product? And just keeping track of that for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, and you can begin to get a sense of what's happening with the amount of time spent in your team related towards building new stuff versus being dragged down in engineering work side of things. Um, you'll note in the bottom one here, this little dip here, you may have dips like that. That may normally happen as part of your business model. So like Etsy, for example, is famous for their code slush in Q4, where they're not shipping new biz features during that period of time. But what you want to avoid is something kind of that you see on the uh, upper one. So how do you avoid ending up, ending up getting here? That's kind of the, the big question. So in putting this talk together, I realized actually that a lot of our engineering best practices really actually deal with avoiding technical debt in some form. Whether it's you know, doing your technical strategy work, um, looking at requirements, which we'll come back to in a minute, code reviews, pull requests, all of these things, they in some form actually help inform are you doing the right task kind of balanced against the business needs. Um, the non-tech hygiene stuff is actually really important too. Um, some of that stuff will prevent tech debt. Uh, but the management debt will also kind of pile up if you don't have some amount of this stuff happening at certain scales. Um, and most of these, you're better off having something informal than nothing at all. So take requirements, which I mentioned a minute ago. Coming from really small environments where we're talking about three to 20 people, formal requirements that you might have in larger companies are just non-existent usually. And for requirements, I'm talking about everything from business requirements to product requirements to technical requirements. Um, it's all of those things are um, important to have in some form, even if it's informal. Um, so this really isn't an engineering suggestion as much as it is kind of a general product one being involved in building products. Um, there's this IBM story from a couple of decades ago where they were in the process of developing uh, a speech-to-text system and they wanted to understand how they'd integrate it with office workers. And they did this, um, what I've heard jokingly called pretendotype. Uh, set up where they got the, the worker came in to try using the system, they had a microphone, and they had brought in a stenographer to sit in the next room over and listen to the microphone and type everything the person said. So they didn't actually build any of the software. They completely pretended it. And then they could see, oh gee, this office worker doesn't want to really use the software because they're going to be talking in a busy office and the whole point of typing is it doesn't make noise. So it saved them, as the, as the story goes, a fair amount of development time because they didn't have to build the thing and then go and realize that it was not the right thing to build. Um, so even if you're in a small team doing something informal, whether it's paper prototyping, um, pretending, 
um, hallway testing, all that stuff can be uh, incredibly useful. Then there's a couple of different retrospective formats that I've used that I find to be useful. Um, yays and nays are, as they sound really simple, it's basically just what's, what was good this week? What sucked this week? Uh, and the real benefit out of this is to pay attention to what people say nay to. Uh, your engineers probably already know some stuff that's creeping up and creating debt in some form. So I had one team where they weren't able to send emails through a staging system. And that actually came up as a nay. They couldn't test stuff. They actually had to push it to production to see if their edits were right. We're like, hey, this is kind of silly. Let's, let's fix that. Um, other types of debt tend to pop up with the nays as well. And a lot of times, they tend to be non-technical. Everything from like, hey, I can't hear the audio in our phone system. OK, let's grab some acoustic foam and put it on the ceiling. Um, to like, our, our meetings you know, our laptops die in them because there's no power strip in this room to plug our laptop into, which is really incredibly stupid. But if you don't actually ask, hey, what's going on here? What's, what's not working? Then you won't actually get that feedback loop to go and do the stupid thing of buying a $10 power strip and going, hey, that problem's now fixed. Start, stop, keep retrospective. Um, this is actually really useful, easy to do. Grab some post-it notes. If you've got remote team members, you know, use a Google form. Ask them, hey, what should we start doing? What should we keep doing? What should we stop doing? And then out of that, see if there's trends. Can you group things together and go, hey, this particular thing is coming up. Maybe we should do something about this. Pick just one, or one two, or three things out of this. You'll get a list that's way longer than that. Um, trying to go through the whole list uh, will just be nigh impossible. But if you do it monthly or quarterly, and you pick up the top couple of things out of it and, and fix them or correct them, um, it actually can make a real difference. Um, from one conversation I had with the team, we, we just didn't have a continuous integration server, which sounds kind of crazy at this point, but it came up as a, hey, we should start doing this. And this actually gave permission to go and do it because we talked about it as a team. And that permission is actually really valuable too. And then the third retrospective uh, technique that I found <coughs> useful is this, hey, why did we ship that thing? Um, and this really depends on your environment. So the environment this was in was an environment where we were dealing with a lot of reactive work coming in from the company as well as product work we were having to deal with. And that reactive work that was coming in was really distracting to dealing with the roadmap work. So how do you kind of prevent that reactive work from piling up? What trends might exist in there? So in this case, it was just, hey, let's look at the pull requests that get merged to the main line every week. What's the trend in these things? And you'd be surprised what trends pop out. Sometimes it's like, oh, again, we just need to, we need to do testing in a more rigorous way uh, before we ship things, because it would actually prevent follow-on work. Um, again, informal stats are better than nothing, um, but pay attention to those trends. And you can actually take those trends into your start, stop, and keep um, metaphor. So another really important thing about technical debt is to realize it is inherently present. It will always be there. If you're writing code, you are also creating technical debt. So making, cleaning that bad debt up part of the culture is really important. And the best way to do that is to schedule time for it. And there's different size uh, bounds for scheduling that time. Polish day, this is the idea of take one day, it might be just one person working on something, it might be the whole team, maybe every two weeks, maybe once a month, you set aside a day and just say, hey, the small things that you've noticed over the last couple of weeks, you know, keep track of them, let's come back to those and just knock off this, this, all the little details that you know, pop up. And that might be engineering ones, it might be design ones, it might be copy editing ones, you know, it's all over the place. Um, but it's actually really good to get rid of the small little stuff. Then you can go a little bit larger and do a hackathon type approach. Take two or three days with a team at some point and say, hey, what is it that we think we could build that would make sense to help the company? Uh, again, stuff in that category of work uh, ends up, in some cases, removing some of the technical debt. And then more formally, if you've got sprint cycles, um, just plan one. That's a, that's a debt cleanup um, cycle. Error logging and production, by the way, can be a really great source of kind of the small bugs that pop up, and sometimes those can have really large impacts. I know of, uh, one case in one of my teams where we had a bug that had occurred only 100 times or so over the course of a couple of months, which on this team was something that was kind of down in the noise, but it happened to be a bug that completely prevented conversion of the customer. It was actually costing us money, but it was so small in the noise that it never popped up as a major signal. Um, so giving time and saying, hey, culturally, we need to spend time doing this is really important. So what if you do end up here? And this is, this is the hard part of tech debt, because it can be kind of a tragedy if you actually get to that point. It's not really clear there is any simple answer. It's really going to depend upon your situation, 
um, the scale you're at, um, and getting to that point where your tech debt is overtaking all of your time, um, it's kind of the beginning of a tragedy in some cases. Um, you have to examine what's caused the team to get to that point. Just clean up the technical debt will not um, solve the problem because it will just come back. So something else is allowing that amount of technical debt to pile up. One last funny slide. It's probably self-explanatory, but um, technical debt is not the same thing as bad code. Um, there's no amount of process or system or thinking that can prevent situations where you just didn't build it very well. <laughs> um, so I'll leave you with that. Um, interesting last slide and say um, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I don't actually know, Dan, do we take questions now or later? Questions. questions, great. I would love some questions. Do you have any recommendations for frequency of addressing technical debt? I know you have the one slide. Yeah, frequency. So he asked about frequency of dealing with technical debt. Um, it depends on the scale that you have it. I would say bake it in. and. You will know if you're spending too much time cleaning up technical debt because you'll just be polishing the floor. Um, I would say, based on my experience, one day every two weeks to a month as a polish day ends up being really nice, kind of regardless. Uh, it ends up being that a lot of people on an engineering team, after they finish something, they like to go do something else. And sometimes just having a day or two to kind of relax the brain and go poke at something can be kind of nice to do. Um, if you're finding that your velocity of releasing business features is getting slower, that's a pretty big signal that you need to actually double down and do more than just small stuff. Um, so pay attention to the velocity at which you're releasing new business stuff. That graph I had that kind of went, went dipped down, that's super important. If you see it really sliding, then like alarm bells. Cool. Other yeah. questions? Have you ever had trouble convincing the business or the CEO the importance of recognizing technical debt? Have I ever had trouble convincing non-technical stakeholders to address tech debt. I'm just gonna say yes and leave it at that. <laughs> Solutions for that one. Um, communicate early and often. Uh, the, the technical debt side of things, especially for non-technical stakeholders, it's something that they don't, it's that, it's that picture at the beginning with the water flowing out of the faucet, it looks fine, but underneath the hood it's actually gushing water. Like how do you, can you communicate that picture? Can you actually bring them along for the story and say, here's what the technical debt is. I need you to follow along and understand that this is gonna to lead to these things down the road. And then they come back and say, that's fine. We need to go on and release features. Um, there is a balance of the economic question of, do you spend more time cleaning up debt or shipping new product features? It just depends on that, that graph of where you are. Other questions? Please. Please. Right. And most of what you want from the past is just to keep adding to the wrong architecture. Yep. Right? And so eventually it's just sort of like you get to the point where you say, well, we really need to be architecture. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, the whole the, the architectural drift that happens over time from if you were to sit down today and rewrite the thing knowing everything you know now. Um, I don't think I've ever heard somebody on the VP of Eng or CTO level say, gee, I'm really glad we completely rewrote the code base. Like, those words just never seem to exist. Um, yeah, there, there will be a drift. I, I remember um, hearing somebody who I respected once make the joke um, that it was amazing that in year one, what took two engineers, five years later, took 500 engineers to maintain. And I thought it was a pretty astute one. And this is somebody who, his name is, like, he would be qualified to make those number of <coughs> estimates. Um, yeah, it is just, that's the challenge of these things. Um, there are plenty of established 10 to 15 year old companies today that you know, have their own bare metal and colo facilities and aren't in virtualized setups. And it's, you look at that and go, huh, that's interesting. At what point will they need to transition over or is this actually stable for them? Kind of comes back to that, well, where, where's the benefit to the business side? I mean, it is this economics question of, do you spend time doing engineering work that doesn't actually deliver value to the business, do you have to actually show the long-term value to the business to, to justify the engineering work? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.